Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Um, I'm not Jamie Bennett. I'm the other Jamie at Art Place. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm the Director of Research Strategies. Um, so first and foremost, I want to say a big thank you to Akram for hosting us last night at the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage. <laughs> And I don't want to spend too much time on stage. Uh, mostly I want to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Julia Ryan from LISC. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of context for why we're having this panel this morning um, and why I'm personally so excited about it. Um, the, as you can see, uh, uh, Julia's bio in the guidebook app. Um, she is the vice president for health at LISC. Um, and many of you may also know her colleagues at LISC, uh, Lynn McCormick and Rebecca Chan, who are also here and very active in the creative placemaking community and field. Um, but I first met Julia two and a half years ago, I think two and a half at this point, um, when Art Place was beginning our very first sector-specific research work, um, we had just commissioned our first field scan on arts, culture, and public safety, um, authored by Caroline Ross at the Urban Institute. And we needed a strong partner um, in the community safety sector to help guide our next steps. Um, if you'll recall, anytime we've talked about our research work, having a, a key strategic partner in the non art sector has been a big portion of, of how we do this work. Um, in Monday's opening plenary, Jamie Bennett mentioned actually in quite great detail a lot of the work that we've been doing with LISC and why they're such a great partner. Um, so, you know, from one, the first step they did, uh, they co-convened with us a working group in February of 2016 in Oakland. Um, many of you here were part of that working group. Um, they run a they do tremendous training uh, through their Safe Growth Institute program, um, through the crime community-based crime prevention program, what Jamie mentioned used to be called something else. Um, and rather than talking more detail about those programs and why they're such a great partner, I want to talk um, mostly about how personally grateful I am um, for the partnership that we've had and for the depth and perspective that Julia and her team has brought to this work. Um, Julia, as I mentioned, is the Vice President for Health, but she basically built the community safety program at LISC um, over many years um, and has a really strong team across the country that has been um, helping us learn, helping us learn about um, the other side of community development that we don't know so much about. Um, Julia's deep knowledge and understanding of the actors, the tensions, the priorities and the possibilities uh, within a very complex and emotional field, um, and the profound respect and love that I've witnessed so many people have for you and your leadership in this field, um, has provided such a strong foundation for everything that we're doing in this intersection. Um, and I share this not to embarrass Julia, um, and not just to express my gratitude, but also to kind of make the point that the kinds of cross-sector, transdisciplinary collaborations that you all are pioneering and navigating on the ground in your communities are also happening at our level and for our place. Um, and also for the researchers that we've engaged uh, to dig more deeply into your work, into studying your work, understanding impacts and understanding um, uh, the processes behind them. And so there's a reason that this work is slow. It started two and a half years ago. Um, we've been teaching each other a lot. I think Julia's team has been learning more about the arts. We've been learning more about community safety, um, getting past language barriers, learning different sort of values, different ways of working. Um, and so I think Julia has been very patient and flexible with us um, as we um, have really tried to understand where the ground is more fertile uh, within community safety for artists to play a substantive role. Um, with that in mind, uh, I want to just say that we are about 10 months in uh, to some work with Urban Institute. Many of the team from the Urban Institute is here, uh, where we're looking at four case studies. Um, and that work will be released in September. And what Julia is here to do today is share a little bit of what we've been learning throughout that process with an amazing lineup of panelists. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you to Art Place. I can say that LISC has really, really valued doing this work with Art Place and with so many of you around here. Um, so I'm, we're so appreciative to be here and be part of this with these amazing folks. Um, so let's jump right in. The title for this session is Creating Safe and Beloved Communities. So clearly it invokes the language and the vision of Dr. King around communities where people care for each other deeply as human beings where we can all expect equality of opportunity, uh, where we can expect justice. And that's really the meat of what this session is about, what this conference is about, but um, in particular, around how we can use arts and culture to create safe environments and communities that we can all be proud of, where we, where we and our children and our families can all feel safe, where we can uh, create communities where we are addressing 
owning the harm of decades upon decades of inequity in our justice system and creating a pathway forward to, to try to address some of those issues and frankly do better. And to create the kind of communities where we have relationships then between individuals who are involved in the justice system, the law enforcement officers and the community members so that there's an individual aspect of creating relationship and trust. We have some extraordinary people here to come talk about this with us, so um, let's dive in. So this is how it's gonna work. Um, and we're gonna have a conversation up here for probably about 40 minutes or so. Um, but towards the end, I hope to have some time where we can send some mics out and hear questions from you. So please, as you're, as you're listening and thinking, take, take some notes and be ready to, to join us at the end there. Sound okay? You guys awake? <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, let's do this. Um, so I'd actually, I'd like to start here with Major Oscar Perez, 25 years with the Providence Police Department in Rhode Island. Woo. Yes, <laughs> impressive. Thank you. Uh, so Major, you've, you've held many different posts over those years, and right now you're over Community Relations Division. That's correct. So I know you've seen a number of times, actually, how arts and culture has helped reclaim a space in the community that people either perceived to be unsafe or was really actually a problem spot. Can you start out by telling us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So yeah, um, on the job 25 years, I, was, uh, I started in patrol, went to... Uh, detectives, became a sergeant, and ultimately became a lieutenant of an area that I actually grew up in. Uh, it was the area of South Providence. Uh, it's pretty much urban, inner city. Um, it's filled with crime. Uh, there's a lot of uh, issues, social issues that go on in that area. And we had this one particular cemetery, uh, which was a space that was used for drug dealing. Uh, the homeless actually set up tents. Um, there was uh, robberies that were going on there, rapes. and. It was suggested actually through LISC and the Rhode Island School of Design, which is a fine arts college right in our city. Um, and we, we were making arrests weekly there. And we were trying to come up with a creative way. Um, and when they mentioned to me that potentially there was a, an artist that was coming in from uh, out of the country, Lee McCormick was also there with this. And uh, uh, they mentioned the idea of maybe lighting up the park, uh, setting up some type of arts and cultures, I'm sorry, inside the cemetery, and it took off. Uh, they came in, we came in actually uh, the weekend before for weeks, uh, cleaning up the park, making, letting everyone know that the police was there, and um, they came in. They lit up the park with lights, uh, they had projectors hanging from the trees, we had project, uh, projected screens, outdoor screens, uh, they had sites with people doing poetry in different sites, we had kids in there, we had home, some of the homeless that came around uh, when we were there as, as, uh, protecting this place, helping us clean up. Uh, they stayed for three days. I was worried uh, when they left in the night. We had people coming from all over the state to see this. In the middle of the urban ghetto area uh, with some high-end cars looking at this thing. And it was just, it just changed the image. You can picture it. You have a cemetery and around it, it's just uh, issues. Um, but it, it changed, it changed the whole image of that space. Uh, it helped us out, um, and uh, people were really appreciative of it. And the police department was an instigator, an organizer of that, right? Was that a typical thing for Providence PD, or? No, yeah, so you know, we as cops, you don't think of, uh, I, I do more now than I did back in 2010 when I was a, a lieutenant, but arts and, and culture, you know, we, we, we're trained in the academy to put handcuffs on people and follow laws and, ensure, but you can't arrest your, your way out of some areas when there's social issues going on and there's quality of life issues going on. So you have to strategically think of things. So for us, it was different. I mean, I was the commanding officer for a district, and when I mentioned this to the men and women that worked for me, uh, at some point they thought I was getting soft. And it's not, it's not about getting soft, it's just about creating change. Uh, and, and, and this was a space that was not utilized properly. These kids walking through the cemetery to go to school and having to see certain things. Um, that just changes the whole aspect of it. But yeah, for me, it was a, an, op an eye opener. Um, now in the Community Relations Division, I'm able to uh, think of how I can use arts and culture to either promote uh, relationships, to uh, have offices maybe explain certain things on stage to kids. Um, so it's, 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 it's useful, it's a, it's a great useful tool. And the resources that artists uh, provide for for law enforcement is just uh, 
it's incredible. It's just, uh, it's just you've got to think of what can be done. Yeah, I'd like to stay on the theme of place for a minute because I think there's so much there. Um, and actually, Faith, let's bring you into it. So Faith Bartley uh, is from the Village of Arts and Humanities in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Not surprised there's some village fans here. Faith is a senior fellow with the People's Paper Co-op yes, um, and yes. has done a lot of that and other work there. Um, but Faith, you told me a story about how arts and culture also kind of changed a space, not a cemetery, but a space where you've done an expungement clinic. Can yeah, so um, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, I feel so honored and privileged to be among you guys. Um, so uh, talking about, so imagine going into a welfare office or a food stamp office and it's all drab and it's dehumanizing and people are there just taking a number and ranting and raving. It's really nothing to occupy them. So when we go, through, when I go set up an expungement clinic, I kind of transform the room by placing art of formerly incarcerated women and men, uh, posters, uh, even photographs from about six feet high with words that imposed on them like empowerment, encouraging words. And also, we have a paper making station. So once the person goes in and get their record, like get a print out of their record, I kind of tell them to come over here if you like to turn that print out or that record into a clean sheet of paper. So I have a blender, I have a vet, I have some water. <laughs> And I want to make a paper smoothie, right? So I get them. They said, Faith, you do it. I said, no, nah, it's your record. We want to, you know, we want to feel good about this. It's like a good feeling. So why don't you go ahead and rip it? So they go, right, right. So they're ripping up a part of their lives that they want to kind of forget. But society so reminds them constantly when you go for jobs and all that. So when they rip it up, I push the button. It turns into a paper smoothie and I create a brand new piece of paper for them. But I asked them to add, answer this prompt question. Without my criminal record, I could be or who I am today. And they take this writing and they embed it into the wet paper and it dries up. And then for them to take a photo, right? So you don't see the mugshot of whom they used to be, right? You see a reverse photo of who they are. So I snap a Polaroid, and I also, after paper get dry, I embed that. The, the photo represents who they are today. The writing represents who they aspire to be or how does this feel to them. And it's like a clean slate. It's like a clean slate of paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can feel the transformative power of that um, and the use of art for that process. But you also, you're an artist yeah. bringing this into Philadelphia, but you wouldn't always have self-identified that way, right? No, so no, nah, because, uh, so me being a formerly incarcerated woman, right, and um, going through the ups and downs of life, born and raised in a very community where I'm now giving back, right? and see myself using drugs, selling drugs, things of that nature, to keep, keep getting locked up and not breaking the cycle of recidivism. So once upon a time before I got to the village, I was working down the corridor from the village like a block and a half at this kind of sort of, we call it a greasy spoon diner with a you know, quick breakfast in and out. And I was locked into that for five years after coming home because I had built up such, well, we like to say criminal history, but I like to say criminal resume, because I got a criminal resume and I got a, a, a good resume, right? So after building up such a criminal resume, I was locked into this dead end job for five years. I couldn't find sustainable employment or anything that I was qualified for So uh, with this criminal resume. And I asked, after working there for five years, I asked the owner, I was like, boss, um, you think I could get a dollar raise? Now, remind you, I was making $6 an hour under the table, no taxes, not paying into my Social Security, my Medicare, nothing, right? Disability or nothing. And uh, 
he was like, we're not making no money. Now here was a person with a heavy criminal resume, working your cash register, taking your orders, answering the phone, ordering stock, making sure everything runs kind of smooth in this little restaurant. And you telling me you can't give me a dollar raise because I'm seeing what the journal tells me at the end of my day. So I got really emotional. And the first thing came to mind is that I should rob him. Seriously, guys, right? I should rob him, right? But then something said, no, 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 you're trying to do something different. So guess what? I quit. So when I'm walking down the street, I had this old woman feeling like, oh, my God, Faith, what do you do? It took you forever to get this little, little asshole job, and, like, now you got nothing. And I'm like, oh, my God. So during my time at this diner, I was engaging with people from the Village Arts and Humanities, and I was sharing my story, you know, being the social butterfly that I tend to be, <laughs> running my damn mouth, right? So. Um, <laughs> One guy asked me, he was like, Faith, man, we got an arts and residency program at the Village that's going on. We hired these two artists from Richmond, Virginia about paper making and all. And I'm like, man, I'm not no artist, man. I can't draw. They like, he's like, no, it's so much more than that. So I got to learn paper making, making beautiful books out of handmade paper from my two colleagues, Mark Strankwitz and Courtney Bowles. And I was given that opportunity right there to change my life, and it worked for me. All right. Well, Shelton, I'm coming back to both of you, but Shelton. Um, Shelton McElroy, you are an artist, a writer, a community organizer, currently with the mayor's office right here in Louisville. Um, can you tell us about how arts has been part of your journey to where you are today? Uh, so thanks uh, for being on this panel. Um, and I, I could listen to Faith. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, says before uh, this, I was washing my hands, and one of the uh, participants in the conference uh, said, you must be uh, speaking today. And I thought to myself, like, why would they know that? And, uh, and then they said, um, do you always get nervous before you speak? And I thought, why did they ask that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I asked, why do you say that? And she said, well, you're in the women's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get over that. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm from here, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, uh, the majority of you all, uh, some of you all, I, I know I was asking Faith and she didn't come dance with Cheryl Roos. Anybody dance with Cheryl Roos last night? Give it up. Um, and, um, and Akram Burton uh, in that great space, right? And uh, I, I think about uh, Oscar's points about uh, neighborhoods and, um, you know, the glass half empty, half full, right? So uh, our, our space, Akram, that you so uh, marvelously have carved out for us is in the neighborhood, right? And uh, oftentimes uh, that neighborhood from 9th Street is uh, deemed um, the 9th Street divide. And so, you know, all of the kind of stereotypes that you can put into one basket. Um, and you all enjoyed yourself last night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and so I got the opportunity with Judith Jennings and uh, some more organizers from here in Louisville to uh, host an event there called Mass Story Lab. And it was an event that was uh, shifting the paradigm in terms of how people with lived experience of incarceration actually have dialogue and interaction with the very stakeholders that generally are talking at them. And so in this space uh, with Mass Story Lab at the African American Heritage Museum, uh, we were able to have <laughs> and elevate the leadership uh, of people with lived experience of, of incarceration. And that could be a child of someone incarcerated or uh, someone that had actually been uh, behind the walls. And uh, in that, conversation in that dialogue, 
uh, we're able to understand aspects of how we got to where we are, right? Because we know that in the 80s we had a prison industrial complex of 300,000 people and now we're over 3.5 million people, right? And, and how do we know that uh, we have people that are great researchers? Um, but we were able to understand it from the, the, the folks that it has landed on, right? And so I get the opportunity here in Louisville to use art in a lot of creative ways. Uh, art has segued me into policy by way of Judith Jennings uh, and the work that she does with the Special Art Project, which is chilling every Sunday in the lobby of the visitation area of the jail, right? So how Faith recognized there was a, a problem with spaces that are designated for people in poverty that are very bland and drab and don't have a, a, a sense of upliftment. And so Judy uh, recognized that dilemma and brought in artists that work with the families, the children, as they wait to go into visitation with their loved ones, and that segued us into policy. And so I do a lot of policy work uh, as way of art. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there's so much to dig into here, but I want to pick up on one thing you said about one of your projects giving um, an opportunity for people to use art who aren't typically listened to, I think you said, or you know, people are talking at them, typically. And I think all of you have had experience where arts and culture have given people voice in a different way or encouraged them to think about their own experience and express it in a different way. Um, maybe Oscar, can you start? It's some of the work that Providence PD has done in schools with young people and officers. Tell us about that. Yeah, so with us, uh, thinking in that sense is um, with all the stuff that's going on around the nation and the, uh, you know, the relationships between police officers and the community that they serve, especially with the ju juveniles and the youth, um, there was an idea where uh, we had officers um, at one of the schools, um, and there was a, someone at, at, at the theater uh, teacher actually created this play in which officers acted as, uh, as, as kids, and then the kids became the police officers, and we created uh, scenarios in which they were, pull, get, they were pulling over the officers, the officers were given attitudes, and at one point, you know, it's like <laughs> they couldn't control the actions of the officers. Uh, it was like an educational process for them and for the officers as well. Uh, so we use that in that sense, which helped us out and continue to do things like that uh, uh, to help. And what was the officer's reaction to that, or what do you think they gained from it? I think they gained an understanding of how, what, it, how, what it feels like when you are, we are pulled over and you have someone who's especially seeing what the kids were doing and how they were acting. That's the image, that's the impression that they had of police department, not particularly those officers, but which maybe all the officers that, that pulled these kids over, that's what, they, that's what the impression they had of them. So um, it was an eye opener for them and then there was a discussion at the end uh, on why certain things are done, certain ways, why someone, because when we pull someone over, we want to see their hands, uh, we want to be safe. We don't know if the person behind um, the wheel might have just robbed the bank, <coughs> killed someone, so kids were explaining all that and uh, they had a better understanding of it. Of course, it's good because now they see each other on the street and he said, hello, they, had, they were involved in a play together. So it just builds relationships, and it's through art and through theater. So. Yeah, I was interested in that, because I think changing how people understand each other is so key, but do you see that translating into any change at the department as a whole in terms of how it polices Providence communities or more of the systems level change? Yeah, no, definitely, because once you see that, and you see some offices that are pretty uh, good on stage uh, interacting, all the younger officers will see that and start to understand that there's, there's certain things that we need to value as well, which is uh, educating the public uh, and not so much uh, enforcing laws uh, and, and engaging the public, engaging the youth, uh, especially in that way. So I think eventually, with baby steps, everyone will start to understand that there's a lot of more important things to value. Uh, and it'll be it, it, the organization itself. I mean, we're pretty, I, and not to pat myself on the back, but the department's pretty good at creating relationships. Uh, we're, we're in the community, uh, and we're always looking to be creative, to build more relationships, more partnerships. Um, 
So our men and women, especially the younger ones on the job, start to understand, they get it right in the academy. There's certain things. I come in in the academy and I speak about community relations. I speak about what I'm speaking here today. So it's already implemented in their head. If they come in to the job with a certain mentality, um, they'll start to understand that that's not what the Providence Police values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Shelton, you're working on a project similarly that's using writing in the correctional system to help people better understand different perspectives. You want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I just have to honor uh, Josh, who's sitting up here as well. Um, so I, you know, I get to be local, so I get to see all of my friends sitting in the space. And um, so I think about uh, Josh and the opportunity at Ideas X uh, to use uh, photo voice um, and, and, and photo voice in particular in a neighborhood that had a life expectancy a, a, around 10 years less than other zip codes um, and, um, and able to uplift the voice of people that had had lived experience of incarceration as well as people that really had just been subjected to a lot of, uh, I, I call piss poor policy. Um, and, and, and through using, right? <laughs> like, through, through using uh, photography uh, and expression, we're able to, uh, to tell their story. Um, and so, yeah, just a little bit on piss poor policy briefly. Uh, <laughs> You know, like we see neighborhoods that are are deemed with all of those kind of uh, kind of subjective uh, qualifiers, uh, and then we see uh, policymakers decide, along with private and, and 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 public sector, to reshape and rename and redefine, and we think, great, like. This is a great community. Like water is like five dollars a gallon, and what happened? Like why couldn't you have done that with the community that was here before? Why is it only today that now this community like is extremely safe and has trees and clean streets? And so that's what I mean by piss poor policy. I'm going to use that as my shorthand. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Thank you, Shelton. Um, Faith, back to you in this notion of using arts and culture to give people voice in a different way, you've done some really powerful work in Philadelphia. What's your favorite example? Or wow. So I facilitate a women in reentry program, right, for women that are coming home and trying to reacclimate themselves back into community and society. And for me, I know it was kind of hard when I come home to break the cycle of recidivism because every time I came home, it was like, I felt like a fish out of water, right? I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And uh, so I know what it feels like. I know what it takes for a person to try to attain a good quality of life when coming home by providing them resources. So I'm like a living resource for women that's coming home and men as well. But my focus is more on women. So May 9th in Philadelphia, we had our Women in Reentry Day. Uh, we, we collaborated with Philadelphia Community Bell Fund, and our scream or our chant was to end cash bail, right? End cash bail because there are women sitting in prison right now for less than 200 maybe, $200, and can't make bail. And mind you, these women have yet to be convicted. But because they can't make cash bail, they're sitting in jail, um, rotting away, getting discouraged, having all these problems, right? And it's been my lived experience that once upon a time, I sat in a county jail for four months under $260 of bail and uh, couldn't get out. Um, my mom was in her addiction. My dad was gone. Uh, just didn't have the support on the outside. And um, so in four months, sitting there without, without a conviction, I lost my job. I lost my apartment. I wasn't there to support my mom when she was going through chemo with this cancer thing. 
I wasn't there at her bedside, you know what I mean? And uh, so when we collaborated with Philly Community Bell to release 15 to 20 women from the county jail for this Mother's Day bailout, like, yo, and when I tell you that I was across the street from the county from once upon a time, I was in that county, and when I came out of those gates, it was nobody waiting for me. I had a dollar and a token, right? So when I tell you, like, to revisit that county jail, but being on the other side and watching women come out to, like, some sort of hero's welcoming with a banner, you know, some photographs, some posters, and, like, free our mothers in cash bell chants, you know what I'm saying? That was extraordinary. That was, like, super. So we took that the next day, and we went and posted up down City Hall in the center of Center City. And we talked about, we got these women to speak about their experience and having been released and, you know, how grateful they were and all this. And they were pretty reluctant. They were like, nah, I don't know what to say. And there were all kinds of news media there. Like when we, after they took the stage, it was like, wow. And I was like, I can remember, like if I had had a platform then, or maybe if I would have went in that direction, like the direction I'm in now, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But to see these women come home and like embrace me and thank me, and I'd be like, yo, don't thank me. I mean, I collaborated with a couple of people, you know what I mean? So it was like real warming. And, um, and we took that march from City Hall, we marched down Broad Street, like hold, held up traffic and everything. And we were screaming, free our mothers in Cash Bell. Free our mothers in Cash Bell. And so the women in the internship, the formerly incarcerated women, had helped design this T-shirt. And on here, I'll let you guys get an up-close look, but on here is these three women that I was in the internship with. So that's me, Latara, and Nikki. And these women are screen print here, and this, these are the T-shirts that we wore in the march, you know, to speak to policy. For any of you, I'd like you to help me and this audience draw the line between arts and culture being so powerful at really helping people communicate their experience and drawing that forward to changing those piss poor policies. How does that work? What's, what's the call to action for these guys, for me, for all of us? Yeah, I think always, always, always investing in art as a way in which to uh, enrich your campaigns, your actions, your activities. Uh, uh, never should art be optional. It should always be at the forefront of the experience, the work that you're doing. And uh, when you ingrain it, you create a space where the community that you're working alongside and collaborating with now has agency uh, because as Cheryl Roos's art last night brought us all together from all different walks of life. Uh, that's what your art will do in each and every single one of those opportunities. Will create agency and bring people together collaboratively. So uh, for me, I'm a prime example of, of what art has done. Like they took like the village, they took a person like me, taught me art and language and, uh, and, 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 and look at me, I'm sitting on stage talking about art, you know what I mean? And, and, and using art as a vehicle to get messages across and bring awareness to situations, you know what I mean? So I'll call it like my little art car, you know what I mean, to drive the, policy or to drive the issues and concerns. So yeah, so art was very good to me and it kind of transformed my life. And I'm so appreciative of it. Yeah, for me, especially in, in the profession that I'm in, I think art is definitely a powerful resource uh, that many people don't think uh, it is. Um, all you artists uh, have plenty of ideas, all you live in a certain community, 
they can really provide change with that powerful resource. Um, in the past three days or four days, I was able to engage in conversation with several of you, and every time I said I was a police officer, uh, you were shocked, like, what's a cop doing here? <laughs> so, and I was, uh, and, and I, after conversation, um, I actually mentioned how important it is for some of you to uh, find out, go knock on the police department's door and tell them what you have to offer. Um, artists are probably the most creative people I've ever met in my life. Police departments are constantly looking for creative ways to, to change and to make a community a lot healthier. And there's no way to make anything healthier uh, than, than changing, changing life. It's, if it's space, it's space. That's space that a kid has to come out every day to look at, because it looks terrible. It's, uh, it's an adult, uh, elderly, that have to walk through there to go get their milk. So you can actually change that space. Um, and, and like I said, it's, it's, it's you guys. So you should definitely think about that powerful resource that you can provide to a community, the community that you live in. And, and make, definitely make a relationship with the police department. I was thinking here with the last question that you mentioned as far as voices. So uh, we have a great partnership with the Institute of Nonviolence and Practice. Uh, they offer outreach work throughout the streets. They have uh, actually ex-gang members uh, and uh, people that used to be involved in criminal activities that work for, for, for them. Uh, actually, at the beginning of the uh, relationship with them, um, I was a young detective in the gang unit, and it was confrontational at times. I got to understand the importance of that resource. But my point with this is, uh, there's a gentleman in there, he's a policymaker, and he's an artist, and he's pretty good at drawing. So what he does now is every time there's a homicide, uh, he, he creates a portrait of the homicide victim with, his loved one, with the, uh, their loved ones, and he provides it to, to the families. And he's, uh, it's, it's, I can see it in the families when they, uh, when they look at these portraits. So that's another way to express someone's voice, and it's a, it's a key element for, uh, for uh, success. You know, there's two themes I want to pick up on here in this. So from where I sit, when we're talking about making changes to the justice system, it often seems that there's people working on that within the system, either within police departments or corrections or courts, what have you. And then there's activists in the community. And it seems to me we need to bridge that divide if we're really going to make sustainable change. Have any of you seen that kind of bridge where law enforcement community are working together, perhaps with arts, to do this kind of work? Or what do you think we need to do to get there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I see it more than ever now. Actually, uh, we have plenty of protesters in our city. Uh, but we have, uh, like I was talking, talking to Shelton earlier, we have been able to create a relationship. I mean, uh, it, 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 the activists have a job to do, and, and, I, and we understand it. Uh, so, but, but yeah, it's, uh, it's coming along. I just think that many people are skeptical of, of the police and engaging the police and making relationships with the police. Um, so my, my job is, is to sort of create that relationship. And, and I have no problem knocking on someone's door that may not like police uh, and explaining what we do, um, offering my services. Um, so there is a gap, but I think he's, uh, it takes initiative, whether it is on the police department's part, or on the activist part, or on whatever other agency's part, but it takes initiative. Many people just don't want to stop that communication. I get the opportunity to be on um, a, a white paper uh, called uh, Close Rikers, and, um, and that morphed into a larger campaign. Uh, but in the conception of that paper, we uh, noticed that in the trains, there was uh, no island. There was no Rikers. When you look at the map of the boroughs, Rikers was missing on the map in the trains. And so we um, used art and created stickers that showed a circle and an arrow and said, Rikers is here. And we got on the trains and we placed those uh, because somebody thought that it was best to leave that landmass out of the mines, right, where thousands of people spend the night every single day, and let's just forget about them. Um, and so art and that white paper and what it means for uh, the, the mayor to commit, although, uh, you know, 10 years to close Rikers is way too long, but 
I think to your point about how do we work with um, law enforcement policymakers, uh, you know that that was uh, an example. Uh, currently, uh, I'm actually engaged in a relationship with the deputy warden of Luther Luckett Prison, uh, and uh, Judy helped to create that relationship. But we're going to be in there um, working to write a book. Uh, with folks that are uh, currently experiencing incarceration. Um, and then even as that concept was getting flushed out and we started to, to move that process, um, women are, are, are growing exponentially in terms of incarceration, 300 times. Uh, and so uh, currently in the talks to add to that that, that book so that we have women's voice with the women's prison of Pee Wee Valley. Uh, it's something about Pee Wee Valley, the one and only women's prison. The only photograph I had of my mother as a child in my scrapbook was when I went to visit her in Pee Wee Valley. And so getting the opportunity, that's where it comes in, where those of us that are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, right? So, you know, you getting immersed and getting those opportunities of art and what that means for you to be at the front of the strategies and pushing out Black Mama's bailout. Um, and, 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 and so none of that happens in a void without the stakeholders, the policymakers, the deputy wardens, the police chiefs, the mayors. Um, and so I, I, at Duke Center for Documentary Studies, I took a class called uh, talking to the other, right? Because oftentimes those are the other, right? And we're on this side, and and so learning uh, to have those uh, conversations and, and, and build those relationships. So the one other theme I want to bring up on, and then I'm going to go to you all, um, is actually from some of your comments, Faith. We're talking about changing the justice system, but tied up in that is also creating job opportunities for people, changing the conditions of communities that people live in that are about opportunity. And that speaks to the heart of the Art Place mission about bridging arts and culture and community development. So how do these things connect? The safety, the justice reform, the efforts to have quality housing and job opportunities. What? What would be your call to us to think about how we exploit those connections or pursue them so that what we're not doing doesn't bite us, you know, that we're really achieving some change? So let's see. So first I'm going to start off by saying the Women's Day and Reentry, like kind of sort of event we had at City Hall, uh, because one of the ladies was uh, formerly incarcerated, uh, actually she was in my internship, and it was some sponsors or some people down there and she linked up with and she got a job out of that. Like out of her being there, uh, voicing her concerns about being formerly incarcerated and her lived experience, somebody talked to her and was like, yo, I got a job for you already and that was kind of cool. And it just so happened that I was going to this facility to do a speak, uh, speak to some women, and she was in there at the computer. And I'm like, yo, what happened? How you get here? And she's like, yo, Reverend hired me. They hired me. I'm like, yo, that's so great. So, um, so yeah, and another thing we got is we got, so the mayor's office, when he comes out of his office, there's a cage right next to him with photographs of formerly incarcerated women, re-entry speaking, like words of, like, we need a chance to prove our worth. But me on a poster, like, he has to, every day he come out his office, he got a glance at that cage. And it's got to remind him about the cries of formerly incarcerated and women that are incarcerated, you understand? And to speak to, like, uh, being an activist, like, or engaging, my neighborhood, they they feel reluctant, like uh, Oscar said about uh, police engagement because there were some police that didn't treat them right and all. And so, being born and raised in my community, it's like ah, I need to like not appear like 
we had this no snitch rule. You don't snitch, and if you're seen talking to a cop, you must be a snitch. But now, the, the dynamic of my life and, and my purpose has changed, so I'm trying to get them to know, like, cops are our friends, man. You know what I mean? And it's so good that you want to build relationships with people that advocate for other people like this, you know, so we could take it back to the community or the hood and be like, yo, man, it's just not like that, you know? Hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, in the, in the same sense, uh, as far as social justice, I was thinking here and uh, the reintegration of people. So I sit on the parole board for the state of Rhode Island, and uh, a lot of men and women get released uh, with no opportunity sometimes, and they fail in their freedom. They end up right back in prison. But a lot of them are very talented. I, I met some of the very artistic individuals that were in prison, can you know, draw and do certain things. They have certain talents that they use while in prison, but when they get out, they have no, no, um, no work. So I'm thinking here, and it's like, you know, you have a lot of artistic people here with different companies, and it may be sort of a good idea to maybe hook up with the correction system and find out who's getting released and what type of talents they have, so that when they go back into their communities, they have an option, and they have sort of a, an open door now to get into something that they, they were doing for years in prison and now they're getting out and they be, they're going to be able to have a job, which in, in turn will change that community they're going back into. 75% of the individuals we arrest in our community come right back into our community. Uh, and, and they don't have no work, they have no job, they end up like Faith did, which made the right decision by not robbing that guy, right? Yeah. But it's like some of these guys end up and they have, they have to put food on their table. And what do they do? They rely right back, back into crime. They forget about all that stuff they did in prison. Um, so when you were asking that question earlier, as far as like, what do we do? It's, uh, it's about looking for opportunities to give these people a chance to survive in their communities when they get released from prison. Yeah, thank you, Julie. You threw, uh, she threw me a slow ball, right? Like, I had to answer that one. So, um, so people with lived experiences and what you do, in your foundations, your nonprofits, your research hubs, in terms of um, even hiring, allowing them to lead the strategies. Um, so I, I always think about this experience of uh, a uh, liberal organization, progressive, that leads on a lot of reform and change. Uh, me and the executive director, we bump into each other in this space. And I ask him, I say, uh, you know that, that group, that commission that you have, um, are there any people with lived experiences on that? Uh, and he says, oh, it's a policy group. Right? Somebody got it, right? <laughs> 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 and I just came back from this white paper around Rikers and, and watching like this thing like morph into like, yeah, you know, like, like this institution going to be closed and like creating this new world. Uh, so I, I just I challenge you to reimagine what it means to allow people with lived experiences to not only engage but to lead. Love it. All right. Yeah. All right, we have a few remaining minutes, so we'd like to hear from you. And I'll ask you, since time is short, to keep your questions short. But does anyone have something they'd like to ask the panel? Let's see where the mics are. Someone's running. <laughs> Thank you. If you um, could just say your name, where you're from. Sure, my name is Miriam Axelud. I'm from Albany, New York. Um, so yesterday, someone said art is to um, one of the functions of art is to keep us from looking away from difficult things. And I, and I wonder if there's space in these art projects for the folks with lived experience, um, the activists who say, you know, this, this title is creating safe and beloved communities. It's not creating well-policed communities. Um, and there's a lot of people out there saying our, the policing system is broken. <laughs> or it's not broken actually, it's working as functioning, but the, f the intention is um, inequitable, it's oppressive. Um, and I feel when I hear these projects where the premise is we just need to create better relationships, there, there's a certain point where there's not enough justice present for 
a better relationship to be safe um, for the people who are at the receiving end of that. So I wonder how you, in these projects, leave space for not looking away from that reality uh, if people bring it up. Can, can I, can I, what's your name? Miriam. Mary? Miriam. Miriam, Miriam. Uh, so yeah, unequivocally, you are correct, okay? So what we also have to recognize is that uh, as a society, we decided that we were going to send armed agents with the power of life and death to solve poverty issues, to solve social issues, to solve mental health issues, to solve drug addiction. Like, like we're sending the wrong people, right? But we decided that as a society. So I think, arguably, um, we have to reimagine and re-envision how we want, just the same way we created an institution that we said, like, we're going to put people that have experienced high levels of trauma into a very traumatic experience as way of punishment, and then expect them to come out of that space and engage in community. So, so y yes, you're right, right? Uh, but I think that we have to really accept all of us that go to the ballot that we help to create that toxic environment that is so uh, conditioned to plundering and destroying communities, uh, and that it's not solely the institution itself, but it's us that decided that that's the institution we wanted to respond to poverty, drug addiction, mental health. Yeah, definitely, I agree, I, you're right. Uh, so um, thinking of that sense, uh, as a police department, yes, we do a lot of partnerships, yes, we do a lot of great things, and we can't forget about that broken policing that's going around nationwide. However, I think that it's our job in the profession that I'm in to show others that certain things work. And that doesn't happen unless we can communicate that and we can show that evidence-based practice, if we show that, that is working in our city, maybe others will start to follow. Um, but we do keep that in mind as far as what's going on out there and the problems that society is having with policing. Like you said, it's a profession that uh, on a daily basis, the men and women see a lot of trauma, like you're right. They go into a lot of different calls, uh, and sometimes uh, things happen. Like we can have a perfect department and all it takes is one incident. And it doesn't necessarily have to happen in Providence. It could happen somewhere else, and it will affect us at home. And we have to, again, start all over again to create those relationships. But, but we have to stay focused, and I think the key is communicating. You have to be able to have a dialogue. I have dialogues with us, uh, activists in our city. Um, I set up, uh, uh, you know, help setting up their uh, protest marches and stuff like that. And uh, they have a person in the department that they can reach out to, and that's the key. They have to be able to pick up the phone and say, we can call Oscar at the police station, or we can call this lieutenant, we can call that major. If that doesn't happen, there's no relationship, so. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Another one. Hi, my name is Sophie Constantino, and I'm from San Francisco. And uh, we recently did a, a, a film project with law enforcement in San Francisco, and actually they did it in Oakland as well, uh, which was, we. Conversations in barbershops and salons with law enforcement and community. And ours was special in that we brought young people of color to have those conversations. And our challenge was that the law enforcement, both the sheriff's office and the, the police department, brought in people of color. So it turned into a conversation of, with people of color with people of color. And the problem for us was that we, we, all, we kept talking about well, the, one, the people who aren't in this room are the problem. The people who are in this room are having a great dynamic conversation. Um, we're addressing all the issues head on. Um, and I think at the end we made a great film. Um, but the absence of you know, what everybody talked about as the bad apple cop was not there. So how do we as an engaged community, the, the sheriff, the, well, the police, the chief of police, everybody w was bought in, but the people who make people of color afraid were not there. And of course, 
every once in a while they say, well, there was a white person there. Hi, that was me. Um, right? But as the artist, I was the wrong white person to be there. So I wonder if you could address that, because I think that that sort of tension uh, between races uh, in, in law enforcement and with community is, is the one that we fought. And maybe you have some points of view there. So Sophie, uh, police of color kill people of color at an even higher rate than the latter. So, the, 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 you know, yeah, I mean, creating those spaces to have those dialogues are, are, are important. Uh, Prince George's County outside of DC, uh, 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 African-American, anybody read the book um, uh, Locking Up Our Own? Uh, so, uh, the, the institution is designed, I mean, we have all of these things, we're putting body cams, we're, and yet we see like the slaughter of a human being without a weapon right before our eyes, but the policy says you can do that and be exonerated. Right, so we have to get back there, right? We have to dig deeper and penetrate deeper. It's not just lovey conversations between one another, right? We gotta go, like, you can't kill people that are unarmed, and if you do, you will be incarcerated for the remainder of your life, officer or no officer, right? Like, like that, like, it, we can't sidestep that. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, a lot of these meetings we go to, so we have our district commanders, uh, our city is divided into nine districts, and I can only speak for Providence. I'm not really sure what department that was. But we, uh, we go to these meetings as well, and many times it's myself or another officer, a lot of them are Caucasian officers who are the leaders uh, that come with me to these meetings, um, and then we bring that down to the men and women on the job to teach them what the meeting was about. Sometimes we'll have the patrol officer respond to the meeting, and there's a, there's a key, there's a thing for that, which is just to show them that this, the concerns in the community, and everybody learns. Uh, but on that note, I think that what makes a good police officer is uh, it's life experiences, more than anything, any other factor. If you, if you grew up in an environment, you understand social issues, economical issues of our neighborhood, the quality of life of our neighborhood, that's what makes a good cop, uh, period, regardless of color, in my opinion. I have some Caucasian guys that grew up with me uh, in an urban environment and they're better than anybody else that comes from another suburban neighborhood. Um, so it's, it's, it's that. So you just gotta get the right people in, 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 the, uh, in the meetings, but you have to have leadership to be able to bring that down the line and ensure that when someone messes up, then they need to go. They, they can't be in this profession. I was actually part of a panel in which uh, one of our sergeants, uh, who was a classmate of mine, uh, was fired for making certain comments. So when, when we identify as leaders, someone that doesn't belong in, in any profession, it could be your profession as well, then we have to be vocal about it and make sure we, we, we push them on to something else. All right, we are just about out of time. Any final words from each of you you wanna share with the audience? Um, for me, um, I just want to say what a wonderful time I had at the summit, and I appreciate the fact that arts has got me where I'm at today, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I'd like to thank all three of you so much. I think you've given us a lot to think about, so thank you, thank you all. Julia.